Welcome to what is FemLink Pacific and GPAC, uh, GPAC Pacific's second annual Pacifica Peace Talanoa. And uh, we're pleased to have you, the three of you in particular, at this interactive dialogue. We've changed the format a bit, as you can see, Andy. We've decided to have a conversation rather than people presenting speeches. Um, a little background to the, the theme for today as well um, is linking back to the work of GPAC. Um, and since 2011, the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict has been a strong advocate on increasing cooperation between civil society and regional intergovernmental organizations because uh, GPAC believes that this is an essential way to foster greater understanding of the way in which we can all work together for peace, security, and development. And in fact, at the first in a series of conferences called Strengthening Global Peace and Security for Development, the role of international organ regional international organizations and civil society in Madrid in 2011, uh, GPAC organized this conference with the Organization of American States. And one of the speakers from the Pacific was Andy Fongtoy, who is the Deputy Secretary General of the Pacific Island Forum Secretariat's Economic Governance and Security Program a position she was appointed to in 2011. But for FemLink Pacific and GPAC, we've come to know Andy since she was the head of the political division of uh, the Pacific Islands Forum. In fact, in a role which helped pave the way for um, the convening of the first gender conflict, peace and security high level workshop for forum regional security officials um, that was convened in 2006. And at the time, I had the opportunity to collaborate on the, it was really our first official paper collaborating with the gender advisor of the forum at the time. Um, and that was really a very interesting entry point and in learning about um, something that Crystal mentioned in our, her opening on Monday, that you take what you're talking about in civil society and target it into the way that officials will understand. We're also joined by Brigitte Leduc. Brigitte is the Gender Advisor of the Pacific Community, and in November last year, FemLink Pacific and the SBC signed an MOU to collaborate uh, on media and communication strategies to promote and advance gender in and with Pacific media. And last but not the least, for this week, we have an opportunity for a cross-regional exchange through GPAC with OneApp, the West African Network for Peacebuilding, with Kesha Onambiju Birch, OneApp's Regional Program Officer um, of the Women in Peacebuilding, WIPnet, and uh, Bijou actually represents OneApp in its partnership with ECOWAS in the implementation of the Women, Peace and Security components of the ECOWAS Conflict Prevention Framework. And she also coordinates OneApp's Nonviolence and Peace Education Program, uh, supporting 15 national networks in the implementation of these programs across um, West Africa. So that was just a very quick formal introduction, but I'm going to start by asking each of you, starting with Andy and then on to Brigitte and Bijou, that in the context of the work that you do, um, particularly we all working across regions, you know, um, whether it's the Pacific or in West Africa, on a day-to-day -day basis, what inspires you uh, to do the work that you do and um, how do you think we're going in the region? So we'll start with you, Andy. Good morning, everybody. Well, that, that's from left field because that's not part of the questions that I was given. <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. Just a, a brief personal introduction. Um, for those of you who may not know me, I'm actually from Fiji, and I apologize for the really horrible New Zealand accent that I have because I lived in New Zealand for almost 16 years, and I cannot get rid of this accent. So, <laughs> so my background is that my parents, uh, my mother's from Cora and my father's from Drakete, but I, I think if people look at me, they wouldn't figure that out. But just to let you know that I was actually, I am from Fiji and educated in Fiji till I went overseas. But I think, <coughs> Sharon, in terms of your question about what inspires us um, to do the work we do, uh, I've actually been involved in the Pacific Islands Forum Secretary till the mid-1990s. So I've been with this organisation almost 20 years in total, although I did have a break and went away and came back. So I suppose, and people say that to me because, you know, you probably heard Crystal, they get frustrated with the bureaucracy. And I suppose it's, it's really just, I've grown up in a way in this organisation, I don't see the challenges. But I think 
um, what inspires me is when I go back to why the forum was was established and the forum was established in the 19, early 1970s when the, the countries in the Pacific were becoming independent and the only regional organisation at the time was the SPC which was dominated by what we politely call the metropolitan powers which really were the colonial powers and they would not let <coughs> our island countries who were becoming independent talk about issues such as independence and uh, a nuclear free Pacific for example. So. That is what inspires me, is, is about the, the origins of the organization that I work for. It is really the, the political voice of the people of the Pacific. So I'll leave it at that, and then you know, we can talk more about the specific work we do uh, in conflict. Well, what inspired me, that was a, I, I had to think about that yesterday, I said so many things. Uh, but uh, what inspired me uh, to do my work is that I, I believe that everybody is entitled to happiness. I know it seems very uh, uh, like a dream or an ideal, but um, I, I believe, yes, that everybody is entitled to happiness and, um, and we, should, we should all have the right to fulfill our aspiration because this is what contributes to people's well-being. Um, and this is what makes us human, of course. And I believe in equality and I don't accept that more than half of the population because of their gender are excluded, are, are not, don't have the right to be safe and to be happy. Uh, so this is pretty much what drives me in my work in the day to day uh, with all the frustration <laughs> that, that are there, of course. But um, I s at what I found extraordinary working in a regional organization like the Pacific Community is its original perspective and uh, we see our role as supporting uh, the countries and weaving solidarities between the countries, between women of different countries and different, in all their diversity as well. Um, and somehow we, we are in the country, with the country, but also have this possibility to, to take a step back and, and, and try to see where we can uh, support collaboration and 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 the south south uh, uh, exchange. So, I think this is what is is very interesting in, in in this process. Thank you very much. That's a tough one. Eh? What inspires me? Uh, for me, coming from West Africa, what inspires me most in my work is when I see change happening in the individual lives of women I work with every day. Um, that is, um, the reason for this is because having worked with women across board, from the community level to the national level to the regional level, I have seen that there is one feeling in all women, how women feel about conflict and what they think about peace is common to each one of them. And I will join you uh, in what you said when I see a woman who is empowered, who has the ability to make decisions, who has become assertive. Indeed, this morning, I had to get into an, uh, a mediation across uh, the ocean. I'm here and then I'm making a mediation. It was rather personal, but this is a woman who is not assertive, who is in a, an abusive relationship, who is highly educated, but is not able to make day-to-day -day decisions concerning her life, concerning her family. And for me, when these women are empowered and after a few months are able to make those kind of decisions, it gives me so much inspiration to move on across borders in West Africa and work for women. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for your responses. Um, if we could then bring it back into the, the focus as, as a region in terms of whether it's from an intergovernmental organization perspective or from a peace building network. Andy, as the Deputy Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum, could you give us an overview of what's in place in terms of conflict prevention mechanisms, um, when and how they've been used, and what's the potential for us as civil society, I guess, to get more involved with those processes? Thanks, Sharon. I think, <clears throat> and we sometimes often lose sight of this, I think the biggest 
um, in a way, the conflict prevention mechanism from a regional perspective is the fact that our organization exists at all. And so we have numerous opportunities, almost I would say too many opportunities sometimes, to interact at the regional level. And this starts from the technical sort of officials level right up to the leaders level. So I think the unique status of the forum is, is that we are the only organization that actually has an annual meeting of leaders. And so there's a great opportunity, I think, really, you know, I think it's, it's about confidence building and, and the building of the, the personal relationships. That, so that to me, that's, that's the, the real overarching um, sort of conflict prevention mechanism that we have as a region. If, if we drill down, uh, and I start off by saying that the Secretariat is, is what we call a policy organisation, not a technical organisation. Um, so what we do is, um, if, if you look at specifically areas of conflict prevention and peace building, is our role is to uh, encourage the adoption of frameworks that um, advocates and promotes peace and conflict. Um, so the one that we have, which is specifically about peace and conflict, is, is the Bikatao Declaration. This is very significant for us as a region because for the first time, and it was a consequence of the conflicts we had in, in Fiji and Solomon Islands, the coups in, in Fiji and then the, you know, the, the tensions in Solomon Islands. For the first time, our organization moved away from a principle of non-interference to saying, no, actually, we need to do something about conflicts. And that's quite significant, I think, you know, for us as an organization. Um, so that, that is very specific. And, and <coughs> the, <coughs> the declaration uh, talks about conflict prevention, but also responding to conflict. Uh, and so RAMSI, which is the Regional Assistance Mission to Solomon Islands, is, is under the, uh, this framework of the Bikata Declaration. The work we did in Fiji after the last coup, that was also under the, the Bikata Declaration. Um, but conscious of the time we have, I, I just want to finish off by saying that, as I said, we're a policy organization, so we, we, you know, we, we advocate frameworks. Um, and so we, we also try to... Um, uh, so those frameworks, are said, they, they not only <coughs> they're not only sort of specific frameworks, for example, about human rights and good governance uh, and law enforcement frameworks, but we also try and ensure that the um, causes of conflict, for example, inequality in terms of development, uh, we mainstream uh, those issues so that when we try to ensure that we have an, an equitable and, and inclusive society. Thanks, Andy. I'll come across to Bijou first before coming back to you, Brigitte, um, because you've been involved with ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States. Very quickly, could you give us a snapshot? You've heard from um, Andy about the forum. Can you give us a snapshot of how OneF is working within that framework um, to prevent conflict? Okay, um, OneF has been working together with ECOWAS in the framework of the ECPF, which is the ECOWAS Conflict Prevention Framework, and under which, um, which is based actually on the protocol of ECOWAS on uh, good governance. And in this framework, we have been working on the early warning and early response mechanism. Uh, what happens is one app has been working in the early warning system for some time and caught the attention of ECOWAS. Now, ECOWAS had decided to work with OneEP under the ECOWON. When you come to ECOWON, you divide it into two. ECO is ECOWAS. The one is the OneEP uh, early warning program. So the two of them joined together becomes ECOWON. And this has a regional flavor across West Africa because it has been set up by the member states of ECOWAS. We have been working in that regard with ECOWAS, gathering information to be able to respond because West Africa had gone through lots of conflicts and lots of bloodshed in the 90s. Now, what happened after the working of the ECHO-1 was, when I realized that it is not enough to work within the ECHO-1 system, so we need to involve our communities. That's how come we came out with another framework, which is the news, the national early warning system, because that comes to support the ECHO-1 system. The news is country-based and context-based. So when you come into each of the countries in West Africa, you have the news working, feeding into the regional, which is the 
echo one so that you have community participation because we have realized that we cannot leave the intervention into the hands of ECOWAS. Communities must be engaged in seeing the early warnings of conflict and also being able and have the capacity of responding to those conflicts. So this is the framework in which we have been working with ECOWAS under the ECHO One and the News Program. Thank you. Um, Brigitte, gender inclusion is a key component of peace building. I mean, we've been talking about UNSCR 1325 since the 1st of November 2000. Um, but uh, what do you see are obviously some of the successes in terms of women's participation, but what are some of those persistent barriers which mm. can actually serve as indicators or triggers of conflict? Mm. I, I if you allow me, I will talk about challenges first. And um, we know that one of the main challenges for participation of women in peace building is their low uh, representation in political uh, leadership. Uh, because this is where usually the decisions are, are, are starting. Huh? Uh, the discussion on, on how the peace will be built and who, what kind of committee and so on. So already, we know in the Pacific, very low uh, level of, of a re political representation of women at all level. So this is a big impend impediment to, to, to the process. But it's also about gender norms. So leadership and, and, and security and protect, protection are seen as uh, men's responsibility. Hmm? Um, and yet women are demonstrating every day their capacity of leadership, of mediator, of peace building in, in, their, uh, in their at home, uh, in their community, in the church, um, and in their workplace. So the problem is not that women don't have experience, and this is what people keep on saying, women don't have experience in that. They have a lot of experience. If you have to manage a family, you know that <laughs> you have to have peace building skills. <laughs> so, um, so it's not about that, that, that the lack of experience, it's about not recognizing women's capacity and women's experience. And this is one of the main challenge. Um, so uh, we know that so many women in the Pacific uh, were part of the, the movement fighting nuclear testing. Uh, they were mediator in, in, in several conflict in the, in the region that, uh, that happened in the last uh, 10, 20 years. So it's about acknowledging women's role, existing role, and tapping on this potential. Actually, we deprive all the peace uh, process of the potential of half of the population. So um, half of the population that can have uh, different ideas, different solutions uh, that will enhance the peace uh, process. So um, on the other hand, men are not always experienced in, 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 in mediation or peace building, but doesn't seem to be an issue when it's time to establish committee or, or, or uh, peace building processes, isn't it? So, there are good practices in, in the region to increase women's political uh, participation, but it's new, huh? it's still, there's a bit of, of debate on that in the region. So, for one, we need to have more women in decision making. Um, so, we have the, some, some uh, special measure in, in Samoa, uh, in Vanuatu, but also in the French territories, huh? in French Polynesia, New, New Caledonia, discuss on Monday on huh? French Polynesia 52 percent of the member of the parliament are women so um, these measures exist and and they works in the region um, but what we learn also with all this is that it's not enough just to raise awareness and 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 build capaci women's capacity uh, because if the measures are not if there's not a process to make it happen it's not going to happen so we, ha we need to force it a little bit. And it's a question of good, good governance practices, of inclusiveness, and, and on democracy. I mean, how can we think about a democracy when half of the population is not represented in it? That's, that's not a democracy. So on the head, other hand as well, women uh, who are in the peace building uh, uh, processes, who participate in it, also need to accept to support diversity. Mm? 
so it's not enough to have few women in the process. Those women have to represent women's concern and priorities, but women in all their diversity. Um, so, yes, yeah, so there's one, there's a, the aspect of having more women participating because it's a right, okay, and it's about democracy and good governance and peace. But it's also about having women's concern included across the whole process of peace building. Uh, and this is where we come back with gender mainstreaming approach. Huh? And this is again, so it's not just to have women, but it's to make sure that women's concern are integrated everywhere. And in terms of, you know, implementation of 1325 about, we've talked a lot about more than just one woman, but also, you know, the conversation has to be about diversity and um, bringing that inclusion. Before I come back to the region uh, to ask Andy to kind of talk about some forward-looking strategies, Bijou, I'd like you to share um, your experience of planning, organizing, walking with women in the Liberian Women's Peace initiative in Ghana and how how did you how you were able to work with several groups of women to overcome some of those political barriers well you have thrown me back into the year of 2003 <laughs> you know when we started the WIPNET program which is the women in peace building network program in 2001 our first idea was to build the capacity of women have a critical mass of women who will now go into their communities and replicate what they have learned at the regional level. And that's exactly what happened. Now, when the women, we had four women from Liberia who came into our training, our first TOT. So when they went back into Liberia, they did the replication. Now, when the conflict started again, they contacted us at the regional level. This is what is happening. So we started the brainstorming session this is what and what we can do. We have to issue statements, we have to make demands, and start from there. And then they added the idea of picketing, going into the presidential uh, uh, palace, and sitting there until they were able to talk to the then uh, president, who was uh, Charles Taylor. So from the regional level, we were supporting them in Liberia, in writing the statements, in seeking lots of um, consent from all over, asking people to back their demands until we plan for them to come into Ghana. Now, before they came into Ghana, what we did at the regional level was to go to all the regions of Ghana and speak to our women in the regions of Ghana that this is what is happening in Liberia, and our women are coming to Ghana. We went to the uh, Bujumburam camp where we have all the refugees, and then we spoke with them. Before the women came, the first batch of the women who came were the leaders, so we started working with them. And we involved the media, which was very crucial. I was more or less sleeping in the radio stations because we needed to put on our, our messages across for everybody to hear. Not only the local media in Ghana, but also BBC. It was very crucial for us to pass our messages. So we were working with these women. As the peace talks were going on, we organized these women, put them where the peace talk was happening, and we kept doing the policy part of it. We were supporting them from our regional level in the office, writing statements because they were doing the lobbying. Interestingly, some of the rebels were consulting them. So they needed to know which direction the talks should take. So when the, anytime there was a, a stop, the women were always regenerating ideas, pass this on pass this on. And the mediators were also consulting with our women. And we're not working alone. We're also working with MAWOPNET, which is, you know about MAWOPNET, the MRU women. Okay. So we we're working together. And the interesting thing about the Liberian women was they believed in spirituality. So when things were not moving, I remember there was this day, we had to get into a room, hold hands, and pray. It was amazing. And as they came back, they came to barricade and said, not until you reach a decision, we will not let you go. So we were influencing the process from the regional level and taking care of the women and not forgetting the agenda. We want peace. We want peace. And the women actually thought beyond that because they were very, very positive. They said, we will live here 
with an agreement. And when we live here, we will watch over the agreement and ensure that it is implemented. That's how come the women got involved. And that was our support from the regional level as an institution, WANEP. Thank you so much for sharing that. It kind of resonates in terms of how women have organized in our different countries um, for peace during times of crisis. Um, a challenge has been how do we actually continue that process? And that's actually one of the reasons why we set up our 1325 network to support women on the ground and to try and provide that regional um, support. But it's really amazing that, you know, peace builders do think alike. Um, <laughs> So coming back um, to you, Andy, in terms of, um, you know, we're in a new phase. We had the, the first Pacific Regional Action Plan. I think that was really groundbreaking across the, you know, anyone doing 1325 because it showed a really important model of different groups, um, intergovernmental organizations, the UN, and also civil society contributing to a plan. But how can we now take, you know, the, the kind of the vision of the plan and, and move things forward, not just in terms of women, peace and security, but if we could talk about gender inclusion in conflict prevention and human security? Thank you for that, Sharon. And I'll just, I'll basically follow on for the, the comments received and in particular what, you know, Bridget said about the representation of women. I mean, what I've observed in the region is, you know, is, is the blinding obvious when you have women leaders in the room, it is a very different conversation. And unfortunately, you know, at the moment in, in our region, there are no female leaders. But, but also, we also need to work with the leaders that we do have so that they, they understand the importance of the issues that, you know, we're very passionate about. From a very, uh, you know, then from Sharon the asked the question about how do we move forward in the agenda, I think... And we, we, we say this mantra, but it's easier to, to say it than do it, which is about mainstreaming. We keep talking about, about mainstreaming. From the forum, um, let me just spend a minute or two just explain to you some of our processes that I think you can, you can uh, utilize. We have, in the last two years, uh, established what we call the jargon is an inclusive public process. What it means is that the leaders now understand that <laughs> It's not just about the advice that they get from their senior officials and ministers. We need to be much more inclusive and talk to the, the communities about what you see as important. So we've established a, a process where we call for um, initiatives where anybody in the region uh, can propose an initiative. And we've done this. This is the second year. Um, the report that is going up to leaders um, from, from the subcommittee that's been uh, given this responsibility of collating all the uh, initiatives and then uh, putting it forward to the leaders. The importance of um, having these frameworks is basically it's something that you can then hold the leaders and the ministers and the senior officials to account. Um, and, and just if I can just drill down very specifically, so what we've done is, for example, um, specific frameworks. In 2014, uh, we adopted the the forum adopted what we call the forum principles of security se sector governance. Uh, and one of the principles is to ensure that the security institutions protect and promote women's rights uh, and mainstream women peace and security. So that's an example. Uh, another specific example um, is that, you know, of course, our leaders have adopted uh, a gender equality declaration, and that's, that's very much a, a key anchor for us in promoting uh, gender equality, uh, you know, in all its facets. And then finally, um, countries are adopting national security plans. And when we've assisted the countries in, in drafting those security plans, we've, we've emphasized uh, the importance of gender equality and the role of women in peace and security. Thank you, Andy. So we've got some opportunity in terms of using those existing commitments or mechanisms to, to keep progressing um, the work on gender-inclusive conflict prevention and uh, human security. Coming back to the three of you, um, in, in terms of looking forward as well, um, last year we had the, uh, the global study on UNSCR 1325, and um, as a result of the global study, climate change and environment security, which is a growing human security priority for our region, 
got some traction as a result of you know successive years of Pacific missions and Pacific governments talking about these issues, particularly in the Security Council. So we've seen um, the adoption of UNSCR 2242, um, which reaffirms this. So for the three of you looking at environment security, whether it's in terms of climate change or food security, or even in terms of um, the impact of dis desertification, you know, in the African continent, how can we work together to, to really make sure that there's that nexus between peace, human security, and development? Maybe with you, Andy. Thank you, Sharon. Um, as a region, we've been working for many years on another framework. <laughs> um, and this is a framework to integrate our responses to climate change uh, and disaster response and our resilience to climate change and, and disaster. I mean, we all know, you know, that, that basically when, for example, we have disaster, it is the women that uh, are the ones who take up the responsibility most of the times in responding in, in, in trying to, you know, for example, in, in basic security needs and housing and food, you know, getting the children back to, to school. Uh, and the same with climate change, you know, we know the, the stories about the impact of climate change, for example, on, on access to water, uh, on coastal fisheries. Um, so what we're trying to do is have this integrated framework, and there is a, an opportunity, I think, um, you know, for women to, to you know, use that as, as a, I suppose, a door in, into climate change. But also what I'd also like to suggest is there is a huge focus in the region on SDGs and the implementation of the SDGs. And we're working as a region uh, across sectors and across groups in uh, providing a roadmap because the leaders acknowledge that with the number of SDGs and the number of targets, you know, it's, it's almost impossible. And so what the region is going to do is focus at the region level on what are the key targets. And, of course, countries will have their own targets. And, you know, given that the, the SDGs is about strengthening universal peace um, in larger freedom, you know, through the regional, through realisation of human rights, including um, gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls, I think that that's, that's an opportunity Um you know, there's there's various uh, committees that are that are there's a there's a regional uh, working group that's been set up, and I understand it's inclusive. So I think that's another entry point, and just at the national level as well, I think that's an opportunity. Um, you know, to make sure that 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 when the, the priorities that the governments choose for SDGs, that they mainstream gender equality in in all those priorities. Okay, um, the nexus between peace and development, well. We know that when people are unhappy, when their basic needs are not fulfilled, uh, when their rights are denied, uh, and when they are not feeling safe where they are, this is where when conflict arise. Um, and these are development issues. So they are not separated. So, and again, we have tendency to see development as this is peace, this is development, this is climate change. And we need to break those, those silos uh, sector. Um, now, the concept of development, of course, now we talk about the SDGs, and for many of us, this is a very comprehensive approach of development. But still, at, at very often at the national level, and, and what people see as development is about economic growth. And this is a problem, because economic growth doesn't necessarily lead to development. Uh, it very often creates more inequalities, and um, especially when it's mainly fueled by trade agreements. Um, so my conception of development is far from being about economic growth. And um, it's more about an holistic approach. And I like to use uh, the definition of uh, human well-being. Uh, for me, development is about human well-being. We don't do development for the trees or for the sky. We do it for people. So. Uh, the Convention of, on, on, uh, of Biodi on Biodiversity give a, an interesting uh, definition of human well-being. It includes basic material for good life, like food, water, uh, access to goods, shelter. It's about health, good social relations, uh, relations uh, we, that include respect, um, security and, free and freedom of choice and action. Um, so we see that human well-being is about relationship. And this is what peace is about as well. It's about relationship. Um, so the, the linkages, and, and that's why we always have to come back to what do we mean when we talk about development? 
and, and being very careful when people focus uh, way too much on economic growth. Uh, yeah. So, and in many places, many countries in the world when, world, when we talk about peace and security, it's linked with militarization. And actually, this is where the money is going. There's much, a much bigger budget on militarization than on peace and development altogether, and even climate change altogether. So this also, we need to challenge more and more these issues. So development will not happen if we keep, keep on investing, or not even investing, I would say that's not an investment, <laughs> because it's not an investment of, in peace, of, obviously, but um, yeah, what do we need? When we talk about development, why we do it, and it's for people. Um, from where I sit at the regional office in WANEP, uh, we are running a program on human security in Mali, and uh, we are looking forward to starting a conversation with ECOWAS on the outcome of all this happening in Mali, to start looking with a different eye, and at the, especially at the gender directorate, how they can rework their work plan, for instance, to reflect what is happening, how ECOWAS can support all the new changes we are experiencing in our region. And uh, in Nigeria, for instance, when we are having this new threat of uh, Boko Haram changing the lifestyle of women in the whole of uh, Nigeria, and indeed the whole population, um, they have been sensitive enough, being supported by WANEP, to review their national action plan, for instance, to reflect what is happening in their context so that the country can respond to the needs of women and put the priorities of women, because women are being used a lot in this new threat, to be able to respond to this new challenge. So this is what we are doing, especially we want to start the conversation with ECOWAS based on our human security program in Mali. So finally, and I'm glad um, we, we've kind of geared towards the SDGs as well, because um, I remember when we were even in the early days of trying to connect 1325 um, to the SDGs, there was even some debate amongst feminist peace networks, like you can't talk about peace and security in the General Assembly, but we're really glad that there is now a specific goal on um, peace and stability as goal 16. Um, what we've been talking about as a network as well um, this week has been about um, greater coordination among civil society. How do we also sustain the support for local activism and peace building in order to have the women be in those places, whether it's um, focusing on national security plans or WPS in humanitarian settings. Um, so as a final wrap-up from each of you, maybe just a message for a woman or a young woman who's a peace builder out there. Um, what should we be doing? Or I mean, we can't solve all the problems of the world, not yet. Uh, but, you know, how do we keep on keeping on even when sometimes we feel that there are barriers that we may not even understand? So maybe I'll start with one app and then come back around and give Andy some time to think about that. Okay, Bijou. Uh, my message is very simple. Um, having worked with women, I think every day is a window of opportunity to make an impact. Um, for 1325 to be significant, it has to be localized. A woman should be able to wake up in the morning and walk to her plantation in Cote d'Ivoire without the fear of being raped on the way because 1325 is working on her behalf. And this woman must understand it. If she's denied the right to inherit property that has been left by her spouse, the woman should have the opportunity to air her feeling and have the right to get it back because we have people who are speaking on her behalf wherever they are. And it doesn't matter your age. We want young women in the movement to know that, yes, it is difficult, but day by day, we are gaining ground. Indeed, the SDG G16, I like it so much because it relates to uh, 1325, talking about peace, justice, and good governance, which I think we should really latch on and make sure that we create the linkages so that we have the legitimacy and ensure that everything we are talking about is not just a mantra, but it's being implemented. And lastly, 
document what we are doing is extremely important so that generations to come will see that we have moved at ahead. Thank you. Yeah. On the same line, I think uh, it's nice to have policies and agreement and all, but we have to make the decision maker accountable. These, these agreements, these nice policies, these nice action plan have to be translated into action and into budget. <laughs> <laughs> and it too. So the money is never there. Huh? We'll all agree on, on the same thing when it's about gender equality, but then there's no fuel to, to make it happen. So it has to be translated into action and become reality for people. Otherwise, it's just a piece of paper. That's what it is. Um, also, the message for women is, and, and everybody else, it's change is possible, and it's happening every day. So it's always, we always hear that when we try to promote gender equality, when we try to have more women in leadership, when we try to build peace, and, oh, but this is how it is, you know, this is how our culture, and culture is not, it's not an, a barrier, but this is how it is. But things are changing every day. So, we need to, to, make it, to, to, to make people aware of that. That change, yes, it's scary. Okay? It's not always easy. We don't know what is on the other side. But it's happening, and sometimes it's necessary, even if it's painful. Um, and I think for women working in, in the movement and other women is about solidarity. I mentioned it earlier, but with young women, uh, with, with women in all the di diversity, and Building peace, it starts in our home and our community. So we should not stay silent when we know that a woman in the, in the house beside is, is living in war. <laughs> you know, her home is, the, is a war. Um, so, and, and if we don't start there, it's not going to happen at the highest level neither. Thank you very much. Um, just picking up on all, on all the points, and I totally acknowledge what you say, Brigitte, about um, you know sometimes it's a piece of paper. So I, what I'd like to suggest is, and I agree, change is possible. And and you know I'd, I'd like to share with you some you know uh, if on a on I suppose on a discrete basis some of the experiences I've seen in 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 the region that I worked. Um, what I think is important is because you do need change, you do need the political leaders behind the change. So what I would suggest is that you need to have, you need to identify high level advocates and champions. And I say this because, you know, you, you talked, Brigitte, about um, representation and, and the very poor record we have of, of women parliamentarians. One of our countries has brought in temporary special measures. And that's because, and it also links in what you said about accountability. And that's because the leader of that country went to a meeting and they looked at the list and his country was down the bottom. And he turned around and said to his senior official, we must do this because I don't want to come to another meeting and find we're actually at the bottom. You know, so you think of ways, and in many ways you also said, uh, you know, about personal relationships. And so we can talk, you know, highfalutin words, we can have all this, you know, jargon, but it's what touches people's heart and what, the li as I said, when the light bulb goes off in their head. And that's the language, you know, I'd like you people to think about. So when you advocate, you know, you think about the way you interact with people. You build that relationship, that confidence building where, you know, they don't think, oh, God, here's that woman again. You know, I'm knocking on my door. <laughs> but they actually, they, you know, they think, I want to listen to that person because they are talking sense. Um, but also I think, you know, and this is about speaking the language that people understand and feel comfortable about. Because, you know, we, we do the same. If somebody comes and you think they're lecturing you, you, you don't want to listen to them. So that's, that's what I would, you know, um, but it's also about your networks and your coordination. You know, we, the world is becoming much more complex and that includes our region. And it's about, and the resources are also very limited. Uh, and so it's about your networks and you, Sharon and I had a conversation, you know, before we started this about coordination, making sure you know who's working in the space and you're coming together, you know, as, as a group. Um, and just on, on a personal level, I'd just like to, just to say, as women, we should never underestimate the power that we have. And also, you know, when women, other young, particularly young women look at us, or even women who don't have the privileges that we have. And, and I, you know, again, I'm sometimes surprised when people, women come to me after a meeting and say, you were really inspiring. And I go, why? And that's because I think when we get to a certain position of seniority, we take it for granted. 
but by women, I think we all have to realize that what we represent to other women is the possibility, that it is possible, that the barriers that women, you know, think, you know, and as you said, people think, oh, it's not possible, or, or the cultural impediments, we can actually change that. And I'd just like to, to give an example that in my organization, it is, it is headed by three women. We have a female Secretary General for the first time in the history of the organization, so I think it took us 40 years to get there. Um, we have two Deputy Secretary Generals, and, and people remind me, we had a morning tea for um, uh, International Women's Day, and I was the Acting Secretary General at the time, and I said, two down, one to go. <laughs> and then in September, we got a female SG. We now have a female Commonwealth Secretary General. I'm hoping we're going to have a female Secretary General of the United Nations, so it is all possible. Yes. Thank you very much um, for, to each of you, Andy, Brigitte, and Bijou, for um, I think what's been a really fantastic cross-regional exchange. And just um, if I add it all up, the three of you bring together 37 countries of experience um, from West Africa and the Pacific as well. And so I think it's also another demonstration of the conversation that can happen when you bring women in leadership together as well. So thank you for uh, making yourself available for the start of our Pacifica Peace Talanoa Day. Naka.